the first thing I would like to ask uh, the panel is, what do, what, what do we mean by transformation? I mean, I, when I say that, it's that transformation, like lots of words, you know, disruption and uh, improvement and empowerment, they're just so used, they become bullet points on a PowerPoint slide, and we forget what they really mean. Um, and, and I think it means different things in different situations. I mean, a lot of what we see in terms of digital platforms is, is what I would imagine as an education with a layer of technology. I, it's the same education, but we just layer it with technology. And then we think because it's digital, we call it transformation. So what does transformation mean to you in terms of education? It's definitely not about the technology at all. I mean, technology, we use technology as an enabler. Uh, to be able to do something that is transformational. And what we've really been asking ourselves uh, lately is, how are we preparing the kids today for jobs that haven't even been created in the future? And I guess that's a recurring theme that's been happening around here and at WISE and, and abroad as well. So, you know, the, the major question is, what are we doing today to prepare kids for the future? And it definitely doesn't have anything to do with technology. It has to do a lot with you know, life skills. It has to do with bringing in emotional intelligence, bringing in uh, the, the, the kindness, the human element. What we basically are doing is just using existing channels of distribution, i.e. 2G connectivity, to deliver books and get these kids from on the first rung, get this system working just this tiny bit better. And that is, that is transformational. I mean, we've seen children not only go from no books to reading books, and I'm not just talking about textbooks, to um, coming up to me and colleagues of mine with written bits of paper, with poetry that they want to show. And we've been able to publish that digitally, but publish that. And so you go from a, a child without our books to a child that's publishing something I never did. But transformation for me is really about transforming people's assumptions about how they learn, about what is valued, about what success is, and really most fundamentally about how parents believe in their children. And I really would like to see transform the assumption that to be successful, you have to go to school, uh, that it's bad if you, if you get bad grades, um, and uh, if, you, if you want to be a happy, productive person and contribute to the world, uh, that there is one way to do it and uh, one way to, to conform to the system. I would consider the word transformation rather radical. I would go by putting education on the right track to meet the requirements of the current time. So I would say teaching and education stays the same. You need teachers, but at the same time, you realize that the kids and students are so much engaged now in technology. They tweet, they use the mobile, they're on a PlayStation, gaming and everything. How do we expect them to continue to be stimulated and engaged in a classroom that does not have such tools as well? I think that's part of transformational learning as well, is for to be able to create new content, more engaging content, where you also have video, three-dimensional maps, uh, uh, online lectures. Um, so that's really important in capturing a child's mind. Let's say and see how can we dedicate technology to help us achieve accreditation and, and certificates. I mean, we're not talking just about having the textbooks digitized or just having them in an e-learning format. We're talking about uh, integrating ICT in, 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 in the uh, um, in the content in terms of um, gaming, um, extra software that's more encouraging, that's uh, more explanatory, that would help the teacher to get the message through the students and making it easier hence to acquire the accreditation. How would you test a dyslexic child who's very high functioning as well? So standardized tests are put within a system for a mass population. And the way technology should be used is to personalize education as opposed to mass education. Uh, schools are not factories at the end of the day. We're out of the revolutionary industry. Um, so that's, that's something to think about. That, you know, for, you know, for ministries of education, we don't technically 
you know, agree with what all the ministries do. I think you make an interesting point. Yeah. Um, you know, the ability to technology, for technology to liberate, to find new ways of exploring, new ways of discovery. I mean, the music industry, the film industry, the information industry have all found, you know, they, they realize that these technologies are a discovery technology. Mm. And yet, this technology equally can be, can be used simply to say, well, what we want to do is, is create efficiencies and, and, and de-skill the teaching profession simply to get kids through these tests. I mean, that's the, the sort of the, the, the extreme opposites of each other. The thing is that, that we're not realizing is change has already happened. People are studying in different ways today than they were 50 years ago, but we're not noticing this because the systems are still the same in place. The systems in place are still the same. So we're learning how to pass an exam, not how to learn a subject. This is, uh, the whole educational process is gearing you from, from the minute you enter primary school until, until right after you graduate college, all your purpose by being in this place, except, well, a few people, is how can I pass the exam? The idea is you need to look at the whole process, the whole chain, from a child to a community, to a parent, to become, to become a student, and then to become, uh, you have to look also at the uh, social, social uh, socio-economical structure, the economy, the business, the universities, they all have to work together because it's a cycle. It's not just, I mean, great, all the, all, all the learners said what they want, like to do, but part of our role as a responsible human being is to contribute to society. And I have to be educated enough to be able to either contribute to the economy, to, to contribute to environment, to contribute to the politics of the country, to contribute to growth in, in general. That is defining my role, and it's just not what I feel like doing. But then I think we also need to make sure that, is, is it not right, do you think that we need to inv involve these voices in creating that society? I think a lot of people, generally, not just young people, but people in general, don't feel they have a voice in the construction of that society. And then when we talk about the plan and we talk about the economy, well, the issue is, I mean, somebody mentioned child going into school now and they will leave full-time education if it exists in that form in 2030. Surely governments should be thinking about what economy they want to have in 2030. I mean, a lot of the, you know, we think we talk with a lot of nowism, you know, what, what economy do we have now? Therefore, our education system, even in primary, there isn't that plan. I mean, the, the, the reason I mentioned Singapore was they decided where they wanted to be at a certain point, and all the plans led to that. And I think sometimes there's an absence of plan and an absence of voice in society. I mean, I think that's kind of what I'm hearing. If you see success as, you know, having an influence and having a purpose, it, for me, that's out of a privileged position. Like, you want your education to make a difference. I teach a lot of kids who come from a background where they have no money, and their main purpose is to be able to support their families who are sacrificing a lot to put them in schools. And we, our focus on every education for all has made that a lot of those kids go through the education system and their main purpose is to support their families and there's no opportunities for them to, to get into the working place. That's a good point. Thank you. The day when you actually think that the only reason, uh, it, uh, only reason that you need to have a proper education is need to have a good job, a sustainable job, which creates hierarchy of occupations, hierarchy of subjects within schools with uh, sciences on the top, then humanities, and then arts, and then standardized testing as you talked about. What it does, it just kills the curiosity within the child itself. Like, it kills his uh, passion for something because he is like constantly being diverted to another occupation or another subject in which he has no passion whatsoever. And what it does is, uh, if he had potential to excel at something or occupation, which is not considered uh, to be one of the best ones in, uh, in the society. And so it ends up him not be excelling at anything. And we look at uh, the idea of uh, education itself. It was like to promote, uh, help you become a better human being, progress society in general. And what it will do if like, you're not able to excel at the field that uh, you're passionate about, humanity will not progress anymore then. Instead of assessing people based on tests, what you can do is assess people based on real world performance. And with technology, you can give people the tools to show off what they've built and say, look, if I want to be an artist, here's my YouTube video that has a million views. Look, if I want to be a salesperson, here's this great project that I've done. Look, if I want to build an app or design or whatever it is, there are ways to, to display uh, your talent uh, and assess it in a way that is judged by the rest of the world, not just a teacher. Interesting point. Thank you.